human mind, a complete explanation of the mind can be given in terms of the um, properties and behaviours of the brain and the brain subparts. Uh, now, just to give you some examples, this the work of Eric Kandel, who is a neurophysiologist and Nobel Prize winner, um, who published a book in 2005 in which he said, mind is the complete set of operations of the brain and the basis for the new intellectual framework for psychiatry is that all mental processes are biological. Radical reductionism will transform psychiatry. So that's a very bold statement. But why did he choose psychoanalysis as in the, the title of his book? And why did he choose reductionism? Well, this, the, if you look at his um, autobiography, uh, it seems pretty clear that he chose psychoanalysis because of his background. He entered medical school uh, in order to be a psychoanalyst and it would appear that the reason is that he grew up in Vienna just around the corner from where the Freud family lived and he simply was impressed and he still believes it gives the best explanation of mind, most intellectually satisfying explanation of mind. I don't know anybody else who would agree with that. Why did you choose reductionism? Well, because he's a biologist and that's how biologists think. So the problem is, of course, that you cannot reduce um, mental properties to brain properties. Uh, and in particular, you can't reduce language or anything expressed in language and mental concepts. So, for example, a person who believes that religion is important, and it would appear that Kandel is one of them, would then have to give an explanation of his religion in terms of his brain properties. Same goes for people who um, are very strongly patriotic or support a particular football team or political party or something like that. They would have to explain that in terms of their brain properties and not as a matter of moral choice. So this would appear to be the end of the line for Kandel's reductionism. And is the question then is, is that the end of the line for biological psychiatry? If we get rid of mind-brain identity theory and biological reductionism, what's left? Uh, well, at this stage, it would look like there can't be a reductionist account um, and that a theory of mental disorder requires a theory of mind. Uh, but the problem is, in any theory of mind, there are a number of classic errors. And the first one, of course, is supernaturalism, which is otherwise known as substance dualism, uh, and that's Descartes' problem. The second one is to beg the question, that is to simply assume the truth of that which required to be proven. third one is denial of the reality of mental life, that's behaviourism. Um, and the fourth one is an infinite regress. Now, psych uh, psychiatry itself can't answer these questions, and we might have to go to the philosophers now, can there be a philosophical resolution of the problems of dualism? And immediately the, um, people would say, well, yes, we've got monism. And monism is simply the opposite of dualism. That is to say that there aren't two substances, there's simply one. And there are two leading exponents of this approach today in philosophy. The first one is Daniel Dennett, who's at Tufts University in Boston, and he advocates a, f a philosophy of mind called functionalism. And he starts with a very, very um, critical and, and antagonistic approach to dualism. He says embracing dualism is giving up. If dualism is the best we can do, we can't understand consciousness. Now, um, my, uh, oh, sorry, and on the other side of the country at um, University of California in Berkeley is John Searle, who advocates what he calls biological naturalism. He also takes an antagonistic approach to dualism. He says, I think it's false. He says, above all, consciousness is a biological phenomenon. We should think of consciousness as part of our ordinary biological history, along with digestion, growth, mitosis and meiosis. And later he says, photosynthesis and secretion of bile. Now, I've argued elsewhere that um, monism actually fails. Both Dinette and Searle incorporate dualist elements in their work and that is the only way they can give what would appear to be a monist explanation of mind. That is to say they beg the question. Each of them seems to have believed that dualism means supernatural, which of course is false. So you can have a look at my talk which on monism and psychiatry which is also on YouTube. Um, now the 
the mistake they've fallen into, well, I believe, is um, explained by Watson's definition of dualism. He says, the essence of dualism is two apparently incommensurable orders of being which must be reconciled if we wish to make sense of the universe. And if you use that definition, two apparently incommensurable orders of being, it is clear that Danette and Searle are both incorporating dualist elements in their philosophy. So I'd say that monism fails, uh, so the search for a non-dualist account of the human mind fails, which means that biological psychiatry fails because it can never have a uh, logical rational or sorry logical justification and modern psychiatry is just a proto-science which I've been arguing for years. Um, now if monism fails where in the natural world can psychiatry go for an intellectual fix? You see we need a theory of mind before we can have a theory of um, disturbed mind. We need a theory of mental order otherwise known as a theory of mind before we can have a theory of mental disorder. What we want in psychiatry is a natural account of the mind as a real entity capable of interacting with the material world with no unexplained features. And this is um, summarized in what is known as Turing's paradox. And for a natural account of the human mental functions, we need to be able to explain mental function in non-mentalist terms. This, of course, is what artificial intelligence is all about. That is to say, we need a physical, neuron-based account of mental attributes such as memory, meaning, language, emotion, creativity, and so on. Now, the problem, of course, is that neurons don't have memory, meaning, language, emotion, and creativity. We have to be able to, using, the, uh, sorry, using neurons as, as our material, we have to be able to come up with what are frankly mentalist concepts. And just to remind you here of the aphorism of Philip Johnson Laird, who's a psychologist, I think at Princeton, he said any scientific theory of the mind has to treat it as an automaton. So that's the problem. We want to explain the mind in strictly materialist terms, that is non-supernatural, uh, and in order to do that we're going to have to show that it isn't magic. And that's no mean um, problem. No, uh, that's quite a problem. But there is one solution here, uh, one possible solution, which is called natural dualism. And this is advocated by the philosopher David Chalmers, who's now at Australian National University in Canberra. Um, and he says, uh, we must, he uses as his starting position, we must take consciousness seriously. We can't denigrate it or dismiss it or laugh it off or say that um, we can explain it you know, as in biological terms. We've got to take it as a phenomenon in its own right. Now Chalmers has put forward a model of mind which is essentially a dual aspect theory of mind. On the one hand he's got mind as experience which is what you've got, you know, the sensations, memories, colours, tastes, all that sort of, the pains, all that sort of thing. And on the other hand, we've got mind as uh, knowledge. So mind as experience um, is private. That is to say, I, you can't share my pains and vice versa. It's vivid. Well, the sensation of pain or looking at the colour red is very vivid, but it's ineffable. We can't explain what it is to a person who hasn't already had that experience. Uh, so you can't explain colours to a colourblind person. And on the other hand, we've got mind as knowledge functions. Now that's public because we certainly can share. Um, and we can all uh, know, we can all count, we can all work things out. So um, that's quite public. So it contrasts with mind as private experience. Um, however, mind as a knowledge function is silent. We don't know how we work things out, we just know that we do. For example, I'm speaking to you now without actually planning my words, yet they come out in order and uh, without too many errors. That was nearly one then, wasn't it? And on your side of it, you're listening and understanding what's being said to you without any sense of effort involved. It simply is there. It presents itself. And it's almost as if we're passive um, recipients of the knowledge that is being generated for us. And of course, knowledge is communicable. So there's these three um, features on which the mind as experience and mind as knowledge are profoundly different. And essentially, 